Well, welcome to Saturday morning, Wilberforce Fellowship, to everyone watching our live stream today. Wish you were here. Fantastic place down here at Jackson Lake, south of Atlanta. We've got our Wilberforce, Wilberforce Fellowship meeting here. We've been meeting since 2015. We started Wilberforce at the home of Judge Timothy Batten in Noonan, moved to Indian Springs State Park, and we're here now on Jackson Lake. So it's great to have a fantastic group of guys here over the weekend. In this session, I'm going to be talking about why William Wilberforce is my hero, why we kind of gather around an event uh, in honor of a guy that's not even a U.S. citizen, <laughs> a guy who was actually an elected official uh, in Great Britain. So Wilberforce uh, was an elected official. And I often meet people who feel like politics is somehow dirty or not something that they would really want to be involved in. Uh, and of course, it's just one sector of society. It's not any more important than anything else, but it is important. And I often say it's important for people of faith to consider running for political office. And Wilberforce uh, was elected to this position that's the equivalent of being a member of the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, so, it, and it was a close election, his first election uh, uh, in 1807. Um, uh, uh, this particular election was 1807. You can see how close it was. This is kind of after he's been uh, really promoting abolition. The elections are getting closer. People are running against him. Um, you know, just, uh, you know, not even 30,000 people voting. You know, you compare that to some of our congressional districts. You know, that this is this is really small. Uh, but he was first elected in 1780. So he... Uh, he, he generated a lot of opposition as a result of some things we're going to be talking about today. Wilberforce developed a pillar of thought. And I know this is kind of in his King James English uh, or King George English, uh, but uh, the, this pillar of thought guided him. And I, I want us to have some discussion about this today. We've got some mics scattered out uh, throughout the living room here. Uh, and so let's unpack these four principles and try to see the impact that that this would have if applied today. So the first one is that as a stewardship principle is that each person is endowed by God with the means and occasion to improve themselves. Think about this just for a second. He's basing his political philosophy, the, the way that he's tackling problems in society on first this premise that people actually can improve themselves and that that is something God has endowed them with. I don't know if you, you know, if you believe that or if you thought about that, but I used to tell my own kids and, you know, some of you have met a number of my children. I have seven millennials myself, uh, but I, I would tell them, to take personal responsibility. Uh, and so maybe if they didn't do a chore or they messed something up or they tore something up and no one knew that, the take personal responsibility was that admonition to kind of own it. And uh, and so that was something that, you know, that I tried to instill in my kids and they heard it a bunch. Uh, but the foundational a truth assumes that each person can improve themselves. But the question is, will they, right? Will they actually do it? And if they can, how can we appeal to them to do that? How does that change the way we approach them? It was that this very assumption that Jeff Goodyear and Tom Ty and me and Brian used with the homeless population in Atlanta that Friday morning at 7.30, which by the way, those interviews aired this morning on WGAU radio. Next week, it'll be on four more stations. And then after that, the following week, it'll be on every single podcast platform in the US. So we made the assumption that these homeless people that basically loiter 
on Mitchell Street between Talmadge Plaza and City Hall and the state capitol, we made the assumption that those people would take an occasion to improve themselves. Now, in this case, we asked them to join us in cleaning up eight city blocks from the Capitol to Georgia State to the Five Points Marta Station down to Memorial Drive. And we asked them to pick up every cigarette butt, every every little piece of aluminum foil, every single thing on the street. We gave them some instruction. We gave them a safety vest. We, we essentially gave them a uniform and we made them a part of the team. We gave them, we gave them contractor work gloves. We gave them, uh, we, we gave them uh, a contractor trash bag. Some of them that couldn't bend over, we gave a little picker where they could just pick it up with the device. And then the Georgia Building Authority had pulled a, a, a big trailer up beside our building and they gave me all these rolling trash cans. And as we collected the trash from the homeless person, we handed them a $10 bill. And then one of our workers, Jeff uh, or Tom or me or Brian rolled the trash over to the big trash can and set it there. And then later the Georgia Building Authority took it to a dumpster. We picked up in a mere two hours, half a trailer load of trash. And a lot of this just littering City Hall, the streets around it, the places where these homeless people spend their days. 20 people, 19 males, one female came that day. And, and, and for that hour, we can say that we improved the lives of 19 of the 20 people. We had one disgruntled person who actually collected $40 and wanted more. But 19, 19 were very happy and said so on tape. Their biggest question, when are you coming back and doing this again? I said, well, I'm not the commissioner of sanitation, <laughs> but if I were, to be here next Friday, do this every single week. Can you imagine if someone caught that vision, <coughs> went down there, privately funded, rolls of $10 bills, homeless people meeting you there, collecting the, collecting, uh, the trash. Can you imagine? I mean, the city of Atlanta would look like Switzerland, look like Tokyo. Because the Japanese, they don't like trash. They don't like sanitary landfills. They don't like trash cans. They love beauty and symmetry. I, I could make a case that beauty and symmetry and cleanliness is actually a part of economic development. I could make that case, but it's not my day job and I can't do that every single week. Someone could though, if they caught a vision for it. Principle number two, Wilberforce wanted to respect the rights of others and that meant the application of the golden rule to every area of life. Now the golden rule of course is commonly known to most people, or at least they've heard of it. Even if they're a different religion, they've heard of the golden rule. It's a very, you know, a very in public domain, you know, principle. But what is it? I mean, it is essentially doing unto others as you would have them do to you. It's just a paraphrase of what Jesus has said. And it's not too far from what Zig Ziglar said that I told you yesterday in the tapes that Truett Cathy gave me. Ziglar said, you can get everything in life you want if you help enough other people get what they want. Now, the implication of Ziglar's philosophy is that you are proactively helping other people accomplish their goals. Sounds kind of like the golden rule. Sounds kind of like the teaching of Jesus. And remember what I told you yesterday that sometimes we can take biblical principles and we can secularize them and speak them without King James English and without a chapter and verse 
And people that don't even know anything about the Bible will all of a sudden start doing those things. And the principles work. The principles work no matter where you think they come from. God's principles are true. They were true when they were spoken by Jesus and they're true today. So if if Ziegler is saying proactively help others accomplish their goal, I mean, what does that actually mean? Let me ask someone in the audience. You have mics at each table. Someone want to uh, so you know, grab that and just hold that mic. You got the back table in the very back. If you have, yeah, uh, just pull this one out. Hand it to hand it to whoever wants to to speak. What do you think? That actually means uh, proactively helping other people accomplish their goals. And if you'll grab the mic and speak it on the mic, anyone? Yes, Marion, you've got a, you've got a, maybe a mic right there. Yeah. What, what does that mean? Well, going back to the first principle that you talked about, this resists the temptation to translate self improvement as so much of what we know today as self help. Like the best way probably to improve yourself is to, and in fact, you demonstrated this, get yourself beneficially into the lives of others. That will result in self-improvement. And Marion, you yourself have built wheelchair ramps, put handicapped bars uh, in, in countless numbers of showers and restrooms for senior adults, and you have done exactly the very thing that you're talking about. It's extremely specific. Somebody else, what is this proactively mean Ziegler's f- philosophy of 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 helping other people accomplish their goals. Daniel, I think one of the things I've learned from you over the years is to ask good questions about people's vision or what are they trying to accomplish. Because if you come in assuming you know, they're essentially inviting them to yours. But if you learn theirs first and serve their vision, it's a completely different. That's, I think, what Wilberforce did in forming coalitions. And there's a lot to learn from that. It's kind of counterintuitive, really, to, 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 try to, to try to help someone else do what they want to do before you actually finish up like what you want to do. It, it, is, it is counterintuitive. Uh, and you, th- you might think, well, you know, I think I'll really get my act together before I really start helping other people. Or, or how, how can I have the, the chutzpah or the audaciousness to think that I can actually help someone else. And, and so I think we kind of tamp our own self down with this. Somebody else, what does this mean? Proactively helping other people accomplish their goal. Maybe one more person. Yes, um, Taylor. So along the lines of what was mentioned uh, yesterday about finding out forcing your goal of what the situation should look like on others, but meeting people where they're at and saying, you know, it's like, like a lot of people said, that people don't uh, care how much you know until they know how much you care. It's, it's telling someone that they're important to you before you try to bring them onto your team and accomplish the vision that you have. Yeah, so for me as an elected official, serving at the pleasure you know, of you know, 10 or 11 million people, it means that a person can think and say whatever they want to about me or the things in the sphere that I have some authority in and, and that I need to listen to them. I need to reason with them. I need to defer to their right to have that opinion. And I need to respectfully explain why I have a different opinion. If that's the case, I, I, I have an obligation to do that. It cannot be it's my way or the highway or oh we've got the majority or we've got the votes. You're just going to have to suck it up because we are, you know, we have this. We have this done. That's not that's not the type of philosophy that that Wilberforce had. And it when it comes to an issue, a moral issue like abortion or marriage, weaving God's word as the source for my deeply held religious convictions into the conversation. Because it's not, it's not my 
opinion about life that matters. My opinion is irrelevant. It's the source of life. It's, it's the one who I believe created this planet and gave us this, this beauty that, that gave us the life that we have and the ability to populate this planet. We, he is the one that we honor is is his principles, not mine. And back to what Perry said last night, there's no need for us to take it personally. If a person disagrees with us, it's their right. And it's not, it's not me that they're disagreeing with anyway. But I think we can grab a hold of these distinctives and opinions, and we can make them so important that we make people enemies if they disagree with us. Uh, that's, not, that's not where real force was. Look at his third principle, his third pillar of thought. Forwarding the views of others, being fair-minded and when dissenting to do so with tact and kindness. So forwarding the views of others is very active and very intentional. It is the what. It's what Wilberforce was doing. It is one of these four pillars. Being fair-minded and disagreeing with tact and kindness is the how. It's the methodology. It's when my wife says to me, as I'm leaving and I'm going into a hostile situation, don't forget, she says, sing the song sweetly. Oh, yeah, that's right. Because when you're passionate about something, when people are after your scalp, when they're lying about you, you can get mad. You can take it personally and you can seek revenge. I've sought revenge before. It's an ugly thing. It just about always comes back and bites you. It's just not worth it. That's why I said yesterday, I'd rather, I'd rather have the philosophy that God has my back. Let God extract revenge if he wants because he's very clever. <laughs> he's very clever. And you, the, the Old Testament is replete with examples of people who thought they had God's man or God's woman in a bond. And uh-oh, look what happened. All of a sudden, their armies slaughtered. They're dead. You know, they run out of this. They run out of that. It's sitting back and watching God do what he does best. So for me, it means listening to other people. Fair-minded means that there may be a sliver of truth in what they said, no matter how they said it, and that I, I need to recognize even the slither. Isn't that hard to do when maybe a person, you know, they lead with, yeah, they, they lead with the negative. They give you a list of 10 things that you should do better and that you don't like. But maybe one of them is actually true. Maybe you are late for work. Maybe that is true. So recognizing it, owning it. And if I've told my kids to take personal responsibility a million times, I've told them that a gentle answer turns away wrath two million times. Because to me, there is no truth that is more universal in interacting with people than that truth. A gentle answer turns away wrath. You get your back up with someone, you get in their face, more than likely it's going to make it worse. Listen to them, reason with them, show kindness, do it with tact. Isn't this world just full of snark? 
people are snarking on you and they exaggerate, they conveniently leave out facts and it hurts. But being fair-minded means that there, there may be a slither of truth. It's also acknowledging your mistake, no matter how small that might be. In conversations I have with people, I actively look for something I can say I'm sorry for. I'm looking. My mind, even though it goes slow, it's going back and forth like a radar, looking for where am I possibly at fault here and can I acknowledge it to this person? Hey, I'm sorry I didn't get back with you quicker. You know what, I'm sorry I kind of overreacted with you on this. You know, I'm sorry that I hadn't fully explained this to you. I'm sorry that my position is disappointing you. Find something to gently take personal responsibility for. Tact means no snark, no sarcasm, no belittling, no, belittling, no sense of privilege. I can tell you as an elected official, knowing that I'm at the table, that I have the authority, that I have one of those five votes at the Public Service Commission, that there's a temptation to say, I won the election. I'm the one that gets to decide. That's the temptation. That's the sense of privilege that we don't want to have. Because really, I am just there representing that person. So their opinion does matter. It doesn't matter what political party they're in. It doesn't matter you know, whether they think you know, uh, electric cars are cool or whether they think coal is bad. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't really matter and none of that matters. What matters is that they're there sharing their opinion and I need to show respect. That's what Wilberforce did. This is one of the reasons the man built a phenomenal coalition of supporters. And I'm gonna tell you how he did that. But think about kindness, kindness, it's a fruit of the spirit. Does anyone know the, the verse? Anyone have that by memory? Galatians, what is that? Anyone? Got a mic here, Zoe? Who, who's got that off the, tip, uh, off, the, off the tip of their tongue? But the, but the fruit of the spirit is, okay, pass it to Thomas. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Yeah. Kindness. Kindness is one of those. I mean, you could say that positive thinking is not a fruit of the spirit. It's not. Kindness is. Being kind to others. Man. It is what we need to be known for. Are you known for that? As people think about you, do they say and he's such a kind guy. They should. I mean, there's nothing against max masculinity to be kind. There's nothing against ambition to be kind. Kindness is something that we need to be practicing every day. Fourth principle is the promotion of happiness of others. Anyone remember the Declaration of Independence, what Thomas Jefferson wrote about happiness? Can I pass the mic to anyone? Yes, would you hand it to, to Zach? Zach, what did Jefferson say? All men are endowed by their creator uh, to, uh, to enjoy their natural rights of life, liberty, and joy. The, yes. As he said, the pursuit of happiness. Yes. Wilberforce took it a step beyond Jefferson. Not just your own happiness. Wilberforce says we are responsible to promote other people's happiness. Thomas Jefferson, brilliant guy, great guy. Caleb walks around up there and on the grounds of the University of Virginia, Mon Monticello or Monticello? Yeah, so Monticello is here in Georgia. Monticello is up there with that little French version of that. 
But Wilberforce took it a step further. Which would you say is more biblical? Hmm? Jefferson <laughs> or Wilberforce? Jefferson was a ah, Jefferson was a deist. I'm not going to jump on Jefferson here. I'm grateful for, you know, for all that he did. And there's certainly a lot of mistakes that he made and the lessons we can learn from his life. But let me ask you, why did Jefferson put into the Declaration of Independence? And we'll start with Zach here since he quoted it. Um, why did he put something in about happiness? Give the mic to Zach. Zach, put you, you know, you're the youngest guy here. So let's, let's put you on the spot. What do you think? Well, I think um, it, it was what he viewed as what were the natural rights that, um, that were, that was part of this enlightenment movement. Yeah. So people that came over here on the Mayflower, I mean, they had spent years in Holland, you know, they're, you know, they were doing tasks that they were way overqualified to do. They were not allowed to worship as they, you know, as they, as they chose, they, they had to escape their country to have just some degree of happiness. And I don't know if you've ever done menial tasks that you were overqualified to do, but it can be not so fun. And so certainly the folks that came over on the Mayflower uh, and then those that followed them, you know, were living the dream. And Jefferson put it in there. Who else? Why is happiness relevant? Uh, somebody take the mic. Why is happiness relevant to what, you know, to, to what Thomas Jefferson was doing as we declared our independence here? One more person. Yes, hand the, hand the mic to Taylor. You see in Jefferson's writings that uh, what he meant by it was this sort of root of uh, eudaimonia, a sense of happiness, which was not just um, you know some fleeting emotion, but it was fulfillment of purpose. And our purpose as human beings is to use our reasoning and to glorify God in, in the manner that we use our freedom. And that's why freedom was necessary to pursue happiness. Touche. Touche. This is almost another version of Wilberforce's number two, respecting the rights of others. It's taking it a step further, forwarding or promoting the happiness of others. How is it different? To me, it almost feels like what someone in hosp the hospitality industry would do. Maybe, uh, maybe a Chick-fil-A operator or a manager. You got Perry back there. Perry, uh, would you take that microphone? Um, would you would you mind? Uh, uh, and I mean, you have been to thousands of Chick Fil A stores. Uh, you were probably there when they started using the Ritz Carlton. Uh, it's my pleasure. Uh, you every day, your wife who runs a Chick Fil A uh, store um, probably talks to you about challenges. I mean, why, why is the promotion of happiness in a quick serve restaurant? Why is it relevant? Why does it matter? Um, first of all, thanks for the, for the question. Um, you know, Chick-fil-A just recently created a worldwide goal to be the most caring company in the world and have a whole strategy around that. So I think that caring is a part of that. Caring for other people, caring for other folks, happiness in the way they treat mm -hmm. customers. You know, Truett Pappy said a long time ago that um, when someone mentioned to him that, you know, anybody can create a chicken sandwich. And he said, that's right, that's why I can do it. <laughs> um, but it's not in making the sandwich, it is the way that you serve it and present it. And so I think consistent with what you've been talking about, um, caring about other people, thinking about other people, putting them first, not knowing the kind of day they're having, the circumstances they're having. If you can add a little bit of brightness to the day, then you're gonna build a fan. And that fan can be in the terms of a Chick-fil-A customer, it can be in the terms of a legislator, it can be in the terms of anybody that you deal with. So um, I think making people happy uh, pays back huge dividends because as you know, Chick-fil-A does not look 
at a sale as a transaction. They see it as a relationship that they want to extend for years and years and years. So when they look at a customer, it is not a $7 order. It is probably a multi-thousand dollar return over the years into that customer coming back. So Perry, when my app doesn't work at my Brazzles and Chick-fil-A because it's down in a hole and I have to go into curbside parking place number six and walk in and say, did you get my order? They surprisingly put a little reward onto my app. And the next time I come in, lo and behold, I have an ice cream. So, so they really back that up. They look for opportunities to make it right, don't they? To the customer because you're thinking you know you've lost when that happens you've lost a teeny bit of goodwill you know you've all heard about the emotional love bank you know, you know every interaction you have a first with a person is either a deposit or withdrawal even a neutral transaction is usually a deposit in this person's emotional love bank so whenever you have a bad experience that you have you know you've made a little bit of withdrawal and you have to make that up so how do you make that up besides giving them something to make them happy Thank you. Hospitality. A couple of my daughters have been involved uh, with hospitality, working as a manager for Chateau Alain, marketing manager. And then I have a daughter that's uh, a barista that's worked in several different uh, four star hotel coffee shops. And, you know, they've learned a lot about serving other people and promoting the happiness of the other people, especially early in the morning. Right people can tend to be a little bit grumpy. Um, so generosity to strangers is kind of a biblical perspective on hospitality. I don't know if you've thought about that. It's, it's easy to be generous with our friends. I mean, it's easier to be generous with our friends, especially if there's quid pro quo involved, right? Oh, they were nice to me. I'm going to be nice to them. I owe them this. So we have these motivations for doing things, but true hospitality is generosity to strangers because the person that comes into his wife's store, she probably doesn't know them. And they are not only serving them and promoting their happiness, but if they do something wrong, they're possibly gonna lose every, every profit margin that they had had with them to make them happy. So for me to be generous to people who I don't know. It is standard operating procedure for me. So if you are a person and you're meeting me for the first time, somebody says, oh, you got to go see Commissioner Eccles. Not only might you sit down and have something to eat and have me pray for you, but I'm going to say, how can I help you? And then when they tell me something, I'm going to do something. I like to do something for every single person to ask me something, some tangible action. Introduce them to someone. That's usually a person's favorite thing because usually people that come to see me need a contact. They need a relationship. They need an introduction. And when I do that freely, unsolicited, it is, perceived and accepted as being very generous because I'm sharing with them what I believe is my most valuable assets. And that is my contact list and the lifetime that I have spent building it and developing it and touching it and nurturing it. Because a lot of people in my contact list are people that I've actually done things for. And early when I was in my twenties, or when I was in my thirties, I was more transactional. I wanted something in return. But as I hit, as I hit my fifties and now in my sixties, I like to do it for free with nothing expected. And that's kind of a biblical principle. And that biblical principle has great returns either here or in the life to come. It doesn't really matter to me.
And I'm, I'm very comfortable allowing God to reward and punish me. And I say that with hesitation because I've had the punishments before. I've made stupid decisions. I have been chastised by the Lord and it is absolutely miserable. And I don't, I don't want it. I want to avoid that. I, I want to, I want to check and recheck my actions before I take them so that I don't make that mistake because your criticism to me is far easier to take than the creator of the universe who has unlimited corporal punishment ability. I'm not saying we need to be like scared of God, but I do recognize his all powerful nature. And for us not to take that seriously is a mistake. Maybe you can think of someone that has done something for you. Uh, I mean, people have the ability to improve themselves. Yes. But Wilberforce now says that he's going to inject himself into their situation and actively try to help them in whatever obstacle they may be encountering. So he believes, pillar number one, that they can do it. So why does he feel so obligated now to step in and actively help them be successful? Kind of counterintuitive. Let's review these four pillars. Word it another way. People can and should improve themselves. It's a worldview. I think there's a lot of people that run cities in America that do not believe this principle. I think it's the way, I think this affects the interaction they have with homeless people, how they allow them to, to squat in parks and run, you know, run the city. They pity them. They do not believe that these people can improve themselves. They believe that they are required to help them. And as we look across the landscape of people on our planet, they can and should improve themselves. And let's figure out how we can be a part of helping them. Number two, I will treat you as I want to be treated. This is just plain old honoring other people. And this should check every negative thing that you do. This principle alone should keep you from you know, doing things that would be harmful to others. Number three, I will help you and be kind to you. This is an action step. I'm going to help you. For me at 61, I forget things. So I like to help people right now. You're in my office. We talked about something. I want to figure out something I can do either right now or shortly after you leave to help you. So it's not unusual for me to say, hey, do you have just another second? Let me get so-and-so on the phone. Boom. I make the call right there. I have them on speakerphone. Hey, let me introduce you to this person. We're sitting in my office. We're talking about this. They've got a great idea. They've run into some obstacles. Would you have a minute to help them think this through? Because I don't know that the way they're going is the right way, but I'm not sure. Sure, I'd be happy to, Commissioner. And boom, there it is. You don't know what you don't know, and people sitting in front of you don't know what they don't know. And so oftentimes people have no clue how I can help them. And that is why I proactively do it because they don't even know what to ask me for. Isn't that the generosity God <laughs> brings to us? We, you know, the Bible tells us that, that God knows what we need before we even ask for it. That is why everyone should worship God because 
He knows them without them saying anything. Just like with Google Maps, he knows what happens if you will, if you take this exit, if you go there, if you stop there, if you have trouble, if there's a crash, God knows before it happens. He actually, and this is demonstrated with David in the Old Testament and others as they ask the prophet, if we go, will we win? The king said, the prophet said, if you go, you will surely lose. And David doesn't go. Wait a second. How did God know the future of something that actually never happened? It's God's middle knowledge. Theologians call it the middle knowledge because he knows all possible scenarios. That's why you can ask him. That's why he gives better advice than anyone because none of your friends know 100% middle knowledge. Now, their experience may be somewhat accurate, but not 100%. Number four, your state of mind and experiences are important to me, Wilberforce said. Your state of mind. Perry demonstrated it about Chick-fil-A. But the state of mind of that customer is important, and we're going to make it right. I mean, why not live your life like this as you interact with people? Two other principles, not pillars, but the kind of strategy for Wil Wilberforce gets into the next two things. And, and, and we're going to have some discussion, a little bit of discussion uh, on this. So the four things, uh, all well and good, but how can being this nice change people's minds on an issue that may they, they may be biased toward, like slavery in this case, or even personally invested in? because a lot of those MPs were invested in the sugar trade. Remember the Africans captured often by tribes, sold to traders, put on a very you know, cramped boat with all the things that we saw in the Wilberforce movie, taken to the Caribbean, forced into labor making sugar. The sugar came to Great Britain for their tea, for their Starbucks for them to enjoy their, their, their morning and afternoon tea. How do you convince someone that all of that going towards making my beverage better is morally wrong, especially when they couldn't even see it. It wasn't like here in the South where slaves were out there in the house, in the field, uh, around the auctions, everything. No, Great Britain, they were separated. They were, they were an ocean away. They didn't have it firsthand. And Wilberforce was able to persuade them that it was wrong even with that fact and avoided a civil war. It's a pretty amazing thing when you think about the cost of the American Civil War. So it has to be shrewdness. And this is where strategy comes in. And this is his strategy, that voluntary societies were his chosen vehicle because he thought that the good obtainable through political means had its limitations. I say all the time, politics is, you know, politics is not going to solve problems in America. It's spiritual revival. I say it all the time. Probably people in my own party just cringe when I say it. Yeah, I'm a Republican. I wear that brand. The platform of our party is where I'm at. I couldn't be in another political party as their platform is written. Because it violates core biblical convictions that I have. But Wilberforce, he believed that, that the good attainable through these other means was better. So I spoke about the shrewdness yesterday, but scripture says to be as shrewd as a serpent and as gentle as a dove. Sounds like Wilberforce to me. Gentle, that's one of the fruits of the spirit, gentleness, kindness. Wilberforce is credited with ending the slave trade, but it was only one of his objectives. His larger objective, the one that he started on first, that he accomplished 
was reforming society, something he called the Reformation of Manners. Sounds, you know, like, you know, where you put your knife and fork on the table, but it, it, it was way bigger than that. It first, but changing his culture first involved getting the blessing of some very key people. What he sought to do is to actually create a new ten, trend, to create, you know, think about stuff that happens in California and comes this way. I mean, it happens all the time. Things start out west and they come this way with trends. So he sought to make goodness fashionable. Now, maybe you've watched some BBC TV, BBC TV. Maybe a Downton Abbey rerun, maybe a Jane Eyre film, or any of those shows that depict British life back in the 1700s and 1800s. They're wearing this, you know, fancy outfit in their home. You know, they're having these, you know, they're having these fancy dinners, uh, a very privileged life. The clothing, the formality, the privilege, the pomp and circumstance. That was the rules and protocols that this person, William Wilberforce, was working in. And he was trying to make it cool to start nonprofit organizations. I mean, they didn't have tax law like we have tax law. So they didn't call them nonprofit organizations, but they were charitable organizations. And he was trying to make it cool. He was trying to create a new normal, a new socially acceptable way to live. And hasn't Zoom kind of done that over the last two years? Think about this. The pandemic has changed the way that we work. And there's a lot of people who say, don't want to go back to the old way. And Fortune 500 companies, the biggest, most powerful influencers in America are changing the way that they operate. It's kind of like that, what Wilberforce did. I mean, cars kind of did this to trains, giving people a new level of independence. Trains were the original territorial monopoly. It was in 1879 that my agency was created as the Railroad Commission. It later was changed to the Public Service Commission, but it was to regulate then the most powerful industry in America, the railroads. Now you could probably argue that utilities are close to that. Wilberforce had worked to create reformation societies that essentially were nonprofits and he helped fund them. Let me give you an example. Wilberforce didn't really care what kind of reformation that you were doing. He wasn't like locked into just slavery. You want to start a library? Great, we need more kids reading. You want to help sailors who had scurvy? Fantastic, we need to honor them in their service. You want to print Bibles? Yes, we need God's word to go out across the world. You want to start a mission society and go to China? Because that was popular back then. Great, I want to help fund you. You want to fight trafficking? and join William Booth busting into brothels and saving girls who are heading to France to be sold at 12, 15 times a day to businessmen. Yeah, I wanna help fund that. You wanna outlaw bullfighting and the cruelty to animals? Yeah, call me an animal rights activist. I'm gonna fund them. You wanna stop public dissections of people that have been hung in the square? Yes, that is cruel and unusual, and that is not helping our society. And the list goes on and on. The guy had money, and he was very generous. You saw it in the movie, all the people that were coming in and messing up his house. And, you know, it, it just it unnerved his butler and his, and his staff because he just let anybody in there, and he was so generous. That was just in his own personal stuff. But Dr. McMullen comes to our Wilberforce Fellowship. He has the journals from Wilberforce. He's from Hall. The family gave it to him. I mean, we know for a fact that Wilberforce gave 
millions of dollars away to fund essentially nonprofit organizations. And let me ask you, do you think a person that comes into my office where I pick up the phone and put somebody on speaker and introduce them to someone that they had no way of getting to that they didn't even know they existed? Do you think that person leaves with good feelings towards me? With some affinity towards me? Do you think they're more likely or less likely to go on Facebook and post an ugly meme about me? Yeah, they're a lot less likely. And Wilberforce helped these people. And as he built a coalition around his key issue, the abolition of the slave trade and ultimately the abolition of slavery, he created enormous allies from unlikely people. I tell folks all the time, yeah, it doesn't really matter why a person votes for me. I don't care. It doesn't matter. They can vote for me for the reason of their choice. Because in politics, as I tell my, my Republican colleagues and anyone else who will listen, I'm in the friend making business. I'm serving other people. I'm doing it from a biblical worldview without regard to the party, the color, the station of life, the geography, whether they have a New York accent or a California accent, I am serving them as if they were the most important person on the planet because they're sitting in front of me. And I tell people, the only people I don't help are the people that don't ask me. You ask me to help, I'm going to help you in some way. It's involved paying people's power bill, getting the Salvation involved, Salvation Army involved to help people's power bill. It's involved writing letters of recommendation, giving people rides. It, it, it really doesn't matter to me because I'm sitting there and what is going on in my mind is how can I help this person? And I mean, yes, I'm sure there are people that are callous and snarky and go, well, you're just doing it because you, you know, you're, you're a politician. No, no, I know plenty of elected officials that don't live their life this way. No, no. There's a lot of people, they get to position, they're all set, I'm set. And they enjoy it, enjoy the ride. But Wilberforce, he launched out and help people start these organizations. And then he attempted to persuade these four people, the prime minister, William Pitt, who you saw in his original meeting, William Pitt played by, uh, is it Cumber, Cumberbach? Benedict yeah, Benedict Cumberbatch played that, that part. That was William Pitt, the youngest prime minister in the history of Great Britain. Wilberforce had a very strong relationship with that guy. The Archbishop of Canterbury, because the church was very influential. Queen Charlotte, the wife of the king, and King George III. I often tell people who want to change something about energy in the state, I said, you only have to persuade three people here. We have five commissioners. All you need is three. You just need to learn to count to three. Just one, two, three, and then it's done. Because we have the final say on every issue that comes before us. Yeah, our staff has an opinion. Interveners have an opinion. Paper has an opinion. But in the end, there's a vote and three commissioners decide what clean means in the state of Georgia, how much energy that we're using, what the price of your power bill is going to be, whether we stop or, or, or start plants, just count to three. And Wilberforce needed to count to four. He needed these people. And on June 1st, 1787, the king issued the proclamation about the reformation of manners. It was like, boom, that had to be the providence God because the king's stamp of approval on Wilberforce's philosophy meant that the whole privileged society began to go in that direction. I mean, you've seen the British monarchy over there doing charitable things. They all go out and they speak here and they, they have their pet charities, right? And that's part of the role of the queen and the, you know, and the prince and the royal family. It's the ceremonial duties. Funny story, I was over in the UK touring, not at state expense for those of you watching, use my frequent flyer miles. 
and the state paid zero of this of this money. But we were over touring a number of different innovation projects around Europe. We were down in southern England, supposed to meet this guy at a pub, a guy named Harry. We show up, he's got this dirty Range Rover. We're in there eating. He's in jeans and wrinkled shirt. We hop in his Range Rover and we're going out to see his big solar array that had pollinator flowers and then honey, uh, honey boxes and bees. And so it's kind of a, a cool thing. Solar in Georgia was you know, beginning and there were people saying, hey, you know, we're taking this ag land and why don't we replace it with pollinators? That's good for clover hay, other ag stuff. So I was interested in seeing it. And as we're going along, we were talking about Facebook, social media, important things in life. And he said, well, I'm not allowed to be on, on Facebook anymore. So guys, you know, 35 years old, I'm going, what, what do you mean? He said, well, uh, the, the family has, has taken me off. I said, what, your wife? Uh, what, what do you mean your family? Well, well the family, huh? the royal family. He said, my wife's mother is Camilla, who's married you know, to Prince Charles. Uh, and, and, and then the ladies in the back, um, he said, yeah, I used to be an underwear model. And the ladies that were in the back seat had their phones and they were looking for this guy on, you know, on, on Pinterest or wherever you post your underwear, underwear model shots. So they were like, you know, going crazy. And I'm, I'm sitting there. Okay, wait a second. Yeah. He said, yeah, yeah. The royal family has a lot of solar and a lot of honey. In fact, we want to present to you some royal honey today in a royal honeycomb. So, I mean, it's like, good grief, how did I get wrapped up in the royal family, <laughs> you know, here with Harry? Uh, so it was, it was a cool thing. Uh, but the king, the king said it was okay to do this. And so now you think about his four pillars in the context of helping other people start charitable organizations about an issue they care about. And it... It, it kind of becomes overlaid in it, doesn't it? Uh, you can kind of see, oh, wait a second, this this kind of this kind of makes sense. So I, I don't know if you were starting a nonprofit, what that would be, and we don't have time to go around and ask all of you. But I imagine all of you might have an idea. I mean, Jeff Goodyear might say, you know, that was a good experience for the homeless. I think I'd do that. You know. Uh, maybe Josh's experience working with Salvation Army, maybe if he was going to start something, he might try something over here. Daniel might do something else, you know, to, to start churches. I, I, I don't know. But if Wilberforce was in the room, he'd make a financial contribution to every one of you and check on you and, and help you. That's what he did. It's one of the reasons that I went and got a master's in nonprofit organizations, because I wanted to be more helpful to people like that. The second thing, he believed that laws could not counteract the nature of things or more simply that one could not legislate morality. This is a little bit counterintuitive. Does it sound like any scriptural principle to you? Maybe he's disguising, I don't know, can you, can you legislate morality? I mean, Perry was a senator. Can you make someone change their behavior? No. I mean, it's much better when they change it on their own, isn't it? How much better when God convicts them of sin in their life and then they repent and they turn? How much better is that? <laughs> but if you don't believe that God exists, or you don't believe that he's a personal God, then you might think we need more laws. We need more restriction. We need to force people to do this because we can. Sounds a little counter to liberty to me. I mean, it's all well and good, but how can being this nice, you might say, change people's minds on issues like we've been talking about. I don't know that you personally 
can do it. I think you've got to, I think you've got to rely on God because opposition is going to come. Enemies are going to be made. Wilberforce, he was concerned that raising the abolition issue in Parliament due to the wealth invested in the slave trade was going to have some impact, and it did. People began to plot against him. He made enemies. He first concentrated on the slave trade and then the abolition of slavery. Perry talked about having a plan, creating an outline, adding to it, doing it incrementally. Well, what Wilberforce did it took him a long time to end the slave trade, and he gradually picked up supporters over the decades. Managed to keep his seat despite people coming after him. But he gradually built a majority. He had great persistence, great patience. The promoters of abolition, King William IV said, are either fanatics or hypocrites. And in one of these class, I rank Mr. Wilberforce. I would like to have the king tweeting about you. It is, and I'm sure kept the man awake at night. He wound up dying of health problems. It had to be enormously stressful. I would imagine he had many death threats. For me, I, I, I like to confront my critics in private. I surf social media looking for people saying bad things about me. I take it to a direct message. I try to build a relationship. I try to solve whatever they're asking to be solved and talk them off the ledge. It works about 50% of the time. I have literally had people go back to a post and say, just talk to Commissioner Eccles. I misunderstood this. I appreciate his being so accessible. Nothing even better than that. The fishing pole that I have downstairs that you saw me using on the lake yesterday was custom made for me in 1987 by a guy at our Ford dealership who made custom fishing rods. But the reason I paid him in 1987 dollars, $150 for just the rod was because he hated my guts. He hated my faith. He hated the fact that I was involved in ministry. He hated that the owner of the dealership liked me, he considered me a prima donna. And in every instance he could, he criticized me, mocked me, ridiculed me in front of other people. But I knew he liked one thing a lot making fishing rods. And I went to him, I said, hey, Doug, I pretended he had never said a bad thing about me. <laughs> hey, Doug, I've seen some of those rods that you've made and I wondered if you could make me one and, and then put this inscription on it because he's, he personally inscribes them. And you can see, you can see my fishing rod down there. It is a phenomenal fishing rod. And it's got Doug Ellington's name on it. He made the fishing rod, and I don't care whether he had said 150, 250, 500, I would have paid him anything because I didn't really care about the money. What I cared about is neutralizing the anger and the hostility that he was showing to me. And guess what? It worked. It worked. It stopped immediately after I paid him the money. You might say, oh, that's, I, don't know, I don't know if that's right. You're bribing people to like you. Okay, call it what you want. <laughs> You're entitled to your opinion. It's not my money anyway. God's money. I honored him. I honored him. I returned good for evil. And he liked it. 
because that's a biblical principle that works too. <laughs> Guess what? There's a pattern with these biblical principles. They work. <laughs> and that's why you need to help people in your life, in your orbit, see that those principles are great for life, for practice, in marriage, in business, in every part of their life. Don't let money stop you from blessing other people. There's some very generous people in this room. They understand this and they use their money to bless others. You should too. And it doesn't really matter how much you have, right? It's all relative. You be generous with what you have. Let's end with this, that in 1807, the abolition of the slave bill was finally passed and it became illegal in Britain to buy or sell people. An amazing conclusion to decades of work. The bill itself represents an incremental step. Notice they didn't outlaw slavery. And I think a lot of times people view politics as kind of the art of compromise and it compromises somehow dirty. Perry spoke to incrementalism and the value of it. This is it from a legislative perspective. I, I hear legislators say sometimes, oh, I took what I could get. You do what's possible. You take that, you move on, and maybe get some more later. More often than not, big changes in society come about incrementally. Give yourself to something big. Ask God to use you. Emulate other leaders of the faith. And then do your best and leave the results to God. Let's close in prayer. Lord God, we acknowledge that you are all-knowing, omnipresent, omnipotent, and able to lead us and direct us. We pray for the downtrodden, the folks that feel neglected, the folks that feel discriminated against, the people that, that feel lonely, the people that can't provide for themselves. We lift them up today. We ask you to give us ideas on how to be able to serve and help them. Lord, I pray you would prosper financially, everyone within the sound of my voice, that they might use that money to accomplish your will, your plans, and to bless others. And we thank you for those in this room that are actively doing that. And Lord, I pray prosper them even more. We thank you for the life of William Wilberforce, his dedication to ending the slave trade. As black pastors said in New York after this vote that William Wilberforce was the Hercules of abolition. We thank you for that, for sustaining his life until he was able to finish. We pray you would create Hercules out of this group to accomplish your plan. In Christ's name we pray, amen, amen. We're gonna take a five minute break, so we'll see you back in just a few minutes. This time, but but we'll yeah, we'll, we'll 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 think about it. We normally do. We do at every global book. We're changing things up a little a little bit. I mean, this group in and of itself is pretty small. So and we are having room for discussion because after Perry, Preston's going to leave more discussion. Um, so, but we're not doing because we have limited time, and I, and we wanted to add add more recreation. Um, we did two, two big things different in this. We upped our quality.